these were clearly made for a very well-to-do, very wealthy, probably very powerful person. And we don't want to just jump immediately to the Medici as the Fl Florence's leading family because they were the leading family. But in this instance, we have all sorts of really compelling details in the panels which really do suggest a Medici commission. Actually, I've always wanted to work on these pictures. These are two very large Cassoni panels by the very brilliant Florentine painter Francesco Pesolino, who sadly died young, so his works are very rare. There are lots of little dents just in the upper central part of each panel, and that is where the keys of the chest were left dangling and bumped against the paint. They have lots of scratches, some possible deliberate defacement, and it's always said that's done by small children in the families that own them because they, could, they were down low and so they could get at them and they scribbled on them. By the standards of Cassoni, they've been well cared for. There are no big losses, there's just one here and one on this panel, um, lots of little ones, and then this bizarre loss down the middle of each of them where it would appear that they were cut in half at some point and rejoined. We have a horrible suspicion that this was when they were on the market in Florence in the late 19th century. I think somebody cut them in half, hoping to sell them each as two, as four panels. Somebody else walked in and said, no, not a good idea, and they were put back together again. Hi there, we're here in Conservation 3. We've got Jill working away behind us on the Triumph panel. And um, Marta and I are going to be having a look together at some of the amazing technical images that have come out of her research. We pointed out many times how skilled this painter was and in order to depict such a busy scene, mm. he had to plan everything in detail. And I think that the technical images show that while he was painting, he was following his plan mm -hmm. quite carefully. Yeah. Uh, there is only one area that uh, where I was able to identify a change made during the painting stage that might uh, mean something. Uh, and it is around the head of this figure. So the lady that wears the um, tall headdress was initially painted much wearing a much smaller compact headdress yeah. and this shows rather nicely in the lead x-ray fluorescence map. The type of headdress that she ends up wearing, the pink headdress, is known as the sella or saddle headdress because of the shape, the kind of two uh, horns with the dip in the middle. And this is a headdress that's actually um, outlawed by Florentine sumptuary laws initially in the, uh, in the late uh, 1440s and then again in the, in the 50s. Sumptuary laws are essentially kind of governmental controls on what people can wear. And really the people who would flout the sumptuary laws would be the most important people, likely the kind of people who were above the law, so really the most important people in society. And that's, that got me asking all sorts of questions about whether perhaps this group of women might be intended to represent a specific group of women who were living at that moment in mid 15th century Florence. The observations that have been made during the course of the conservation treatment about evidence of an old keyhole and also the damage from the dangling keys means that we're now really confident that these panels were originally part of cassoni or um, chests, painted chests, which would have been in the uh, so-called camera or bedchamber, probably of a married couple. Even so, they are exceptionally impressive as Cassoni panels. They're very large and also demonstrate, as we've seen, um, an extraordinary level of workmanship. Our conclusion is then that these were clearly made for a very well-to-do, very wealthy, probably very powerful person. And we don't want to just jump immediately to the Medici as the Fl Florence's leading family because they were the leading family. But in this instance, we have all sorts of really compelling details in the panels which really do suggest a Medici commission. The idea is not entirely new. Scholars had already suggested that something so lavish potentially had been made by the Medici, not least because of the apparent presence of certain Medici insignia and symbols. Some examples. Here, you see on the soldier's uniform, this device here, which also reappears over in the battling 
nights. This is a torch holder or a kind of lantern holder. And it's a device which the Medici start to use in the 40s and 50s in the various works that they commission. It's actually a lantern holder that you can still see on the corner of the Medici Palace today. Another detail is in the helmets of the Israelite soldiers, these wonderful plumes of feathers, which actually, as you can see clearly over here, demonstrate three colours, red, white and a brown, which is probably a discoloured green. And in fact, the Medici used a device of three feathers inside a ring and used the three colours, red, green and white. Um, a detail that appears across both panels is the falcon. We have him here, perched in a bush and a tree and also swooping for prey, but also in a kind of more heraldic form. Here you see a perch on the top of the tent, a golden falcon. And in the triumph, you see these falcons perched on the arms of the triumphant army. During the 1440s and into the 50s, Piero de' Medici, who was rising to become the leader of the Medici family, increasingly began to use the falcon as his own very personal emblem and often incorporated it into works of art and manuscripts that he commissioned. So we might be getting a little bit closer, not just to a commissioning family, but potentially to a commissioning individual. These fantastic lions that we see in the wilderness where David is tending his flocks. They're included partly for the narrative because David famously fought away lions to protect his flocks. But also we know that the Medici were very keen on incorporating lions into works of art that they commissioned for their palace. And very finally, the subject itself, David. David in the beginning of the century was a very civic figure. The Florentines celebrated his triumph over the giant Goliath as a representation of their triumph as a smaller state over the tyranny of other larger aggressors. But increasingly in the middle of the century, the Medici really appropriated the imagery of David and started to commission works of art with the figure of David to really communicate the message of their triumph over tyranny. So overall, all these various symbols that have been really cleverly and very intricately woven into the narrative of the two panels seems to suggest a Medici provenance for the works. The other thing that comes out rather nicely from the X-ray fluorescent maps is the distribution of the gold and silver leaf that mm. he used um, throughout these panels. Uh, we have some scans that were uh, collected working on the triumph of David. The images immediately draw our attention to the smallest tiny details where he was using these metal leaves, even sometimes in places that are rather unexpected. So, for instance, in the bit uh, of the horses, he used silver leaf, while in the bridle he was using gold leaves. In some of the horseshoes, there is use of silver leaf in tiny, tiny details, uh, and that is highlights quite a high level of skills in application of these small pieces of silver over balls. Skill in application, also amazing forward planning. And this is the most amazing image that I was able to collect. Mm -hmm. It is showing the pink dress decorated with feathers of this uh, girl. The gold X-ray fluorescent map shows that instead of applying a large gold leaf underneath uh, the area to be destined to become a dress which, and then painting over it that would have been typical. what would a typical artist yeah. would, would do at that time. He cut out very small pieces of gold, mm -hmm. each one individually tailored for a feather in the dress, so that show a level of detail that yeah. is amazing, I would say. I really, really like the uh, helmet, uh, crown helmet worn by souls. He cut these pieces very, very precisely, considering how difficult this shape is to mm. render. And we have to remember that gold leaf itself is incredibly fiddly, super, super thin, and fantastically um, difficult to kind of fly away and lose in your hands. So he must have been a master of um, handling this very complicated material. Repairing damage to gold leaf on this scale is very fiddly. Now normally when people are gilding frames or backgrounds to paintings, they can use large pieces of gold leaf and use a gilder's tip like this one. But of course the bits I'm doing are absolutely minuscule 
So I'm just using little fragments of gold leaf and I shall actually work with a paintbrush because it's much, much smaller. The area I'm going to gild is very, very small, but I've protected the original material around it with a small amount of varnish. So that doesn't matter if the gold does stick because I'll be able to take it off again later. So exactly as in traditional gilding, I wet the bowl, which I've already applied and burnished. And then I pick up the strip of gold leaf. And then lay it down. These fragments are absolutely minute. They're just leftovers from gilding bigger things. They're often called skewings. Get this brush, this is where one really does want to be ambidextrous. Um, in particular, being able to see the silver maps is really interesting because much of the silver has now tarnished. So in a way, by seeing the technical images, we have a much better understanding when we look with our eyes at the panels themselves of exactly where the silver was very carefully laid. Reflectance imaging spectroscopy images also helps uh, reading the silver armour, as mm -hmm. you were saying. So in particular, reading the lines, the black lines, uh, defining all the shapes, mm -hmm. but also the presence of some black paint that um, absorb in the infrared, so appears black in these images, and highlights where uh, he was using the paint for modeling the silver, so giving an idea of a three-dimensional shape, mm -hmm. uh, even on a metal lathe. The darkening of the silver leaf is not critical because actually Pesolino then glazed over it and modelled all the detail of the armour. So it can't ever have been gleaming white silver. It was always a little bit dark because he's modelled it as armour. That makes it a little bit easier to restore. And it also means I would not restore the areas of damage using silver leaf because that's unnecessarily bright and it's difficult to manipulate because it's much thicker than gold leaf. And also it would tarnish, and so what's the point? Even if it looked good originally, it would look awful later. I take a completely opposite approach to the gold leaf, and in this case, I'm going to use a synthetic material, so it's easy to use, but also easy to reverse. And so I shall just be painting that on, um, very, very thin layer in the places where the silver still has a bit of a gleam.